Welcome to The Rabbi and the Shrink. This is Dr. Margarita Guri, The Shrink. And here's everyone's favorite rabbi. Jonathan Goldson. And um, the rabbi and I have a guest that is amazing. He knows how to think about conflict in a way that will add value to anything you do. I'm asking the rabbi to introduce him because the rabbi has read his book. Rabbi? Well, I was introduced to Sam Artery by a mutual friend online. And uh, he reached out to me and he offered to send me a copy of his book. And I tried to very politely decline. <laughs> because I get offered books from time to time and I'm a very finicky reader. And, and I really didn't want to have him go to the expense of sending it to me and not read it or even worse, read it and not like it. But um, he very gently persisted. And um, I said, okay, go ahead and send it. And, uh, and, I, and I opened it up, I started to read the first few pages and then I got hooked. Uh, I was very impressed. And the book is positively conflicted. I love the title because I think it, it describes so many of us on so many different levels. And of course, Sam, you're gonna tell us more about it. But what really struck me was how you are so vulnerable in describing your own conflicts, your own struggles. And it's so easy when doing that either to come off as a martyr or come off as a hero. And you just come off as a human being. Say, I'm welcome. And uh, please tell us a little bit about you and your mission. Well, thank you for having me. It's, it's an honor to be here. And, and I, I, I sent the book to other people that didn't really want it as well. Uh, <laughs> and, and some seem glad to have it and some I never heard from. So I want you to know it's a mixed response. Uh, I, I was a trial lawyer for uh, about 12 years. Um, and then I learned they were going to start doing this thing called mediation uh, where I practice. And I went to mediation training, not because I had any interest in being a mediator, but I wanted to know what they were going to do to me um, because it was all about me. Um, and ironically, that dovetailed with the same time that I stopped drinking, which has been about almost 27 years ago. Wow. Uh, and, and so uh, I, the, the mediation started at the same time I stopped drinking. And so I learned some new things. So I, I ended up doing one mediation. Now I've done four or 5,000 mediations. Wow. Um, and, and what I found is the things that allowed me to stop drinking and the harm I caused and deal with some of those things were not unique to people that had addiction issues. Uh, the, the uniqueness was simply uh, that people who have addiction problems or alcohol problems uh, had a particularly specific way of responding to life being too tough on life's terms. At least that was true for me. Um, and I found that the people coming in to see me about, about mediations and about conflicts in their lives, um, 100% of them had something happen that they didn't expect to have happen to them. Uh, and we all kind of trust deeply in our own common sense. And so the idea that they couldn't just resolve it with the other person or that they would need a lawyer or even worse, that they'd have to pay money or that someone would tell them, we can't promise you an outcome, um, were all things that, that were a, a slow learning process for me personally. I mean, being a trial lawyer in some ways, I don't want to say it's easy because it's not as difficult as are most jobs, but it's a lot about advocacy and telling other people what I think and, and, and not much about, about listening or having compassion or being aware of, of where other people may be. Uh, so that's kind of a, a probably more than you wanted, but about as quick as I can do in terms of, of what I do and, and how I do it. And, and I've, um, I've been just really fortunate. I happen to be the right place at the right time uh, to have an opportunity to, to do this. So I'm, I'm grateful to talk about it here and, and I'm grateful for you two for having me. Well, we're delighted that you joined us. I'm interested in your ide idea. You seem to understand that conflict is a mixed blessing and you talk about conflict and fear in a delicious way. Would you please tell us about that? Um, I, I, and again, I, I, even with, with addiction issues or conflict issues or when I'm teaching, what I, what I can do is I can share my experience and some people find it applies to them and, and some that it doesn't. But I find most things tend to be fear-based. I mean, even when I teach negotiation to law students, uh, I tell them that the, the fundamental part of it is 
people are afraid of not getting what they want or losing what they have. I mean, that, that's the most fundamental piece of the fear on why we negotiate. Otherwise, I'll give it to you or I'll walk away because I don't want it. Uh, and so that's kind of what I found. Even as a trial lawyer, I was, I was motivated hugely by fear. I mean, how I would look, whether my client would win, you know, all, all those things that, that go along with it. And, and once I recognized that, because my, my, I don't want to tell people I'm afraid. I might tell you I'm concerned, I'm stressed. Uh, I'm worried. Um, I'm feeling a lot of tension, but I don't want to tell you I'm afraid because it makes me feel too vulnerable. So I don't ask people that uh, right away. But my go-to when I'm afraid is to be either angry or sad. I'm not claiming that's universal. I'm not a psychologist. That's my that's that's tends to be what I do, and that tends to be what I observe in other people. And the place it helps me is I trust my common sense just as much as those people that are coming in to see me. And they're not necessarily aligning. But when I can remember when they're yelling at me or when they're crying or when they're doing a little bit of both, it lets me have a, some compassion for them rather than get upset with them because they're not meeting my agenda either as to time or outcome. But it took a lot of practice. And even with a lot of practice, I still screw it up. I mean, I can tell you an example. I was doing a mediation one time uh, and there was a, a young woman who was involved in it. And she was a minor at the time this thing had happened. And she was of majority age when we were mediating. And she was there with her mother and her father and two lawyers. Um, and as we talked about the case all day long, uh, what I realized is everybody was talking but her. Uh, and so I, I stopped for a second. I said, and I said her name. And I said, I've been hearing from everybody but you. Um, would you like to tell me what's going on for you with this situation, what we're doing today? And before she could answer, her lawyer leaned forward and pointed his finger at me, said, I don't care what she says. I'm her lawyer. You talk to me. Wow. W without missing a beat and doing everything the opposite of what I would tell everybody else to do, I smacked my hand on the table. I leaned back at him and I told him, don't you ever come into my office and tell me you don't care, care what your client thinks. Um, and then in a moment of clarity, um, I said, you know what? Um, I apologize for my response. I'm going to go back to my office and you all can decide whether you wish to continue with me or in this mediation, whatever else you want to do. And I went back to my office. Um, the lawyer that had not pointed his finger and yelled at me uh, was a woman I'd known a long time, a really great lawyer. And about 20 minutes later, she comes into my office and she kind of pats me on the shoulder and she said, Sam, I knew we had an anger management problem in the other room. I just didn't realize it was you. Um, <laughs> And, and I find that those times when I complete and we, I gave them their money back, they didn't mediate with me, they got things resolved in another way in spite of me, not because of me. Um, but I find those moments when I'm aware how instinctive, because I was afraid. I, mean, I had three daughters about this. I can give you all kinds of reasons um, that aren't excuses, because there was no excuse for me behaving in a way that I would say was unprofessional. It may be that that lawyer needed to hear that, or maybe not, but there were better ways for me to do that. Well, I can give you another reason. As a psychologist, since you're very empathic and, um, and very aware of other people's, sometimes the person who's exploding is the one speaking for the one who can't speak. Hmm. So it's called the introject. It's kind of like, looks like you need a V8, you know, those commercials, <laughs> right? So perhaps, sir, you were speaking for the silenced uh, client and uh, your explosion may be re resolved uh, some of the conflict because um, you took it on for her and voiced it. So and I'm not excusing. I'm just saying, yeah, I think that's the process. Yeah, well, when, when we when you when when your anger is on behalf of someone else, I think it's entirely excusable. Yes. Even if in a professional setting, it may be <laughs> it's not the ideal response, or perhaps maybe it is. It can be. Well, it was my response. Um, I never saw that. I, the one lawyer who yelled at me and I yelled at him, we didn't see, we have not seen each other since. And it's been a long time. Uh, the other lawyer I've worked with a lot, but it was, uh, I, I appreciate your explanations of it because I don't feel quite as bad. It sure felt pretty darn bad at the time. Well, you were speaking not only on her behalf, but I mean, she had been so silenced and maybe you um, uh, changed her sense of herself a little bit so that she could speak up more. I think that's uh, really important. So back to the temper. Um, I think your defaults of anger and sadness, pretty universal, but the number one default is anger. Hmm. And a lot of times, rather than feel sadness or shame or um, frustration or loss, we go straight to anger because it's easier. And it's one of the uh, fight, flight, freeze with fright kind of 
uh, instinctive responses. It kind of keeps us from having to be introspective, which I know you're a big fan of. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I, it, it's uh, what, what I what I think about with with conflict and negotiation that we sometimes forget is that it's a full body experience. We, we don't separate our, our brains from our bodies or our bodies from our brains. And sometimes I'm not even aware that there's a conflict um, until after my body feels it. Uh, and and so one of the things in this that that I've that I think about and I often would, would finish with this is when I feel that it's a good time to pause, to assess, um, and to choose what my response is going to be. Um, but when I've got that that stuff all going on, that is simply not my instinct. And and the safer the environment, um, like with my wife, for, for instance, we were sitting talking one morning over a cup of coffee, which the way is the way we usually start our day. And I'd asked her about a decision we'd made at the office, an employment decision. Um, and I said, what do you think? Because she's got a lot of wisdom. She often thinks differently about things than I do. And as she started to tell me, I, I was getting angrier and angrier. And I don't mean slap the table angry, but I was clearly getting irritated and fidgeting. And, and she said, I, I, don't, I don't get this. And you asked me my opinion. All I'm doing is giving you my opinion. And it's clear you're really mad. And, and, I, and, I, and in that moment, the bulb went off again. I thought, well, it never occurred to me you might think differently about this than me. Um, I, I thought I was asking for her opinion and all I was doing was making a comment and expecting her to affirm it. And she was simply responding to exactly the question I'd asked in a very honest way. It's um, so annoying when people do what we ask them to do, isn't it? Yeah, I, I love the phrase, why don't, why don't you change so I'll feel better? Um, <laughs> Well, yes, you know, it's, it's very interesting to, to hear you describe that, you know, something that we all, I think, suffer from is that we have, we, we fade in and out of self-awareness and we don't recognize when our own biases, our own shortcomings, our own insecurities are, are influencing our responses, our reactions. And if someone can point that out to us in the right way, then we can immediately recalibrate. But when someone points it out the wrong way, then things start to escalate. You, you, you have in your book a, a story that I wish I would have read 30 years earlier, um, <laughs> that uh, you, you were having a apparently heated argument with your wife. And, uh, and she had a very interesting question that she asked you. Do you share that with us? Sure. Um, my, my, and my wife gave me permission to tell all these stories and to put them in the book. I did not do it ad hoc and then ask her forgiveness later. Uh, we were talking in the middle of our living room and, I, and it was about this, maybe a little before this because it was fall. I remember the colors of the leaves and we're both standing there and I remember which direction we were both pointing um, and I, we're, we're disagreeing. I can't even remember what it was about, but it was really important to me. Um, and finally, I noticed she wasn't saying anything. Um, and, and I, and I just looked at her and I, and I stopped for just a second. Cause I tend to just link one word onto the next. Um, and she looked at me and she put her hands on her hips and she said, Sam, would you rather be right? Or would you rather be married? Um, <laughs> I love your wife. <laughs> yeah. I, I, most people do uh, me too. Um, but, and, and then she left the room before I could answer. And, and it was, it, it was so clear if I'm doing an assessment and, and I do this sometimes with, with students and other people, let's, let's go through and talk about our priorities. Um, my priority absolutely was to be married over being right in that moment. But that was no, speaking of nowhere on the radar, it, it was nowhere in the building um, that, that the marriage was more important than being right in that moment because I was so energized. And, and if I can remember that when I'm mediating with people and they're responding to me that way, and I'm thinking, golly, get some perspective here or stop yelling at me, or don't call me names, uh, th then it helps because I think, golly, they're just no different. They're no different from me. They, they, they just are no different from me. Uh, and those, those, it's like, I, I've got a friend who, who's known my wife, Patty, for 40 years as well. He said, you know, Sam, I read the book and I thought that all royalties should go to her. But, but then he said, if that's the case, she should have been getting royalties from us for the last 40 years, um, <laughs> which is true. Well, a good partner is certainly priceless. Oh, no doubt. No doubt. That's why you tell her hi for us and that we I will. I will. Yeah. So I have a question. By now you're an expert in negotiation. So many people fail to negotiate in a thoughtful and, and useful way. Give us the secrets. 
If we want to truly negotiate something, whether it's with a loved one or in business or wherever, what do you suggest we do? Um, I think there are, there are three questions to ask. Uh, and it's easy to think about them, but it's harder to put them on paper and come up with them. And actually, um, Atul Gawande talked about these three questions pretty clearly in his book, Being Mortal, when he was thinking about talking to patients who, who had some difficult medical decisions to make. The first is, what do you want? Um, and it's easy to say, them, well, I want the car, but there are more details to that than I want the car or I want my marriage to work. Um, so that's the first one. Once you've got that down, the second question is, what are my biggest fears and concerns? And as we talked about before, it's difficult to tell people what we're really afraid of. So just assume this is just for you. What are your biggest fears and concerns? What, what are you afraid of not getting? What are you afraid of, of, of getting? What is it, what you're afraid of losing? Um, because that helps frame it. And the final one is, what trade-offs are you willing to make? Because in a negotiation, there are almost always going to be trade-offs unless you say, I want this and the other person says yes. So if you do those three things, whether it's the car, and, and an example might be people in a relationship. I mean, setting aside from you know, buying cars and things, really not that buying cars isn't important, but I would argue relationships are more important. Um, it might be that one person is deeply into getting outside help for a relationship. And another person that's so threatening, getting outside help is the last thing they want to do. Um, so how people, one, decide that on their own, and then if you're in a relationship with somebody, he, really hearing how the other person answers those same questions differently um, without trying to, back to the agenda piece of it, trying to argue them out of those um, and, and listening to what I call radical listening, listening while putting my agenda to, aside and assuming that there may be a point of view that's different, better, more worthwhile than my own. So those, those are the three things that I, I suggest to people. Those There's some great. other things in terms of evaluating, but th those are, I find them incredibly helpful. Great, thank you. And to have that kind of uh, simple and really practical structure um, as a reminder, as a guide, because you know, really all of life, all of success, all of happiness comes from relationships. And in our conversations here in this, in this podcast, you know, ethics is all about relationships, the empathy, the trust, the respect. And we all want that. And on some level, we all know that. But when we get caught up in the moment, as you said, it just it leaves the room. <laughs> and, and so we have to be able to remind ourselves, we have to be able to remind each other. You know, one of the things that, that I've discovered um, is that when I am involved in a really heated, fortunately, this hasn't happened in a while, but I think we've all had this kind of experience. I'm involved in a heated disagreement and it's escalating and tempers are, are rising and it suddenly dawns on me that I'm wrong. <laughs> and my immediate reaction is, double down, <laughs> start arguing harder <laughs> because now it's not only about being right, it's about admitting that I've caused all this ruckus when I shouldn't have in the first place. Getting our egos out of the way is going to solve so many of our problems, isn't it? It is, and it's so difficult to do, and it comes in the front door and the side door and the back door. It's just, it, it, it's, it's just so present, which is why I think that paying attention to the, to the physical piece of it uh, is, is so important. And, and, and even um, in, in apologies, um, I mean, an apology without excuse or explanation has value, but the minute I start explaining it, it's lost all value um, because it makes it all about me again. Uh, yep. and, it's, I find it much more helpful for me to apologize and ask for forgiveness without requiring it. And, and that's, that's another piece in conflict, particularly in relationships, personal and professional. Um, if, if I've done something wrong, and let's say, um, Rabbi, and that time you realize that you just owned it right away. I, I, well, the, the person may forgive you and they may not. They may forgive you in a week or a month or a year. And, and what, back to the relationship piece, what I've realized is when I've deeply hurt somebody, um, they get to decide when or if they forgive me. There is part of me in terms of my ego and my entitlement that thinks that I, that I get to decide how long it takes for you to forgive me or 
that was 10 years ago, you should be over that by now. Or that was 10 minutes ago, you should be over that by now. Um, and when I can remove that entitlement, I can be back to engaging genuinely with somebody rather than engaging conditionally on how they respond. I think that's the key, understanding that we're two different people. Unfortunately, I think many people have some magic fairy dust. They think that if you love me, you'll understand. That's one of my favorites because when, when people understand that they don't understand, they begin to realize that the fairy dust was just glitter that got in your eye and scratched your cornea, you know? Uh, and I think it's, it's fascinating. What are the signs that you are gonna have a very difficult negotiation? Like before you even talk to them, when you see somebody, what are the clues you have? Well, the hardest are when both sides are sure that they have God on their side, <laughs> uh, which happens. I mean, you've got people that have differences and they've got deep religious beliefs of whatever kind. Um, and there, there's, there's no way I can, I can talk them out of their, their righteousness in their faith, whatever that might be. And, and so that, that's the first one. Um, Almost all the rest, um, most negotiations are hard because by the time people get to me, there are so many steps that have happened to build resentment and to completely cut out communication. I mean, it starts with, oh, I disagree with you. Oh, I really disagree with you. Um, oh, we disagree so much that you've blocked off the entrance to my property um, and you won't move it. And then you hire the lawyer and then it takes too much time and everybody's got their sense of, of fairness and justice. So they, they all kind of get there. So I would say, um, any, any religious belief that God is on your side is, is, is the first clue. Um, the, the second one is the longer it has lasted and the more personal the dispute. Um, and what I do my best to keep in mind is all disputes are personal. I mean, whether it's you know the breakup of a business or a CEO getting let go or the boundary line that I talked about or family members that have been attending holiday gatherings for years and mom and dad die and they, they disagree on who who took care of mom and whether she should have been, should have been paid for that. Um, th those, because they touch so deeply into, into our principles. And I, I was talking with what comes up frequently. This is, if you'd like me to be quiet and do something else, because I'm just rambling now, but. I but, like your ramble, go. Well, one of the things that comes up frequently is people will say, it's not about the money, it's about the principle. And before my hair was all white, which has been a while now, um, I used to think baloney, it's always about the money. And what I have come to believe is when they say that, they believe it, they mean it, and they're deeply vested in it. So the, the route, I because I'm usually doing litigated disputes or disputes, if they don't get done, they're going to be litigated. Uh, and so I will ask, I say, well, you, because there's risk in this process, you've both got lawyers, your own lawyer has told you there's at least a 1% chance you're going to lose. Could be a 20% chance, but when you've got a jury or a judge, third parties deciding, there's no guarantee that they see it your way. So I will ask, let's say that 1% happens. I know you don't think it will, but let's say it does. Are your principles going to change? Nobody has ever told me yes. Nobody has ever said, my principles are so malleable that I'm happy to hand them over to somebody else. If I lose, I'm going to give the other side a hug and tell them, golly, my principles have been wrong all along. Nobody's ever told me that. They've all said, no, my principles won't change. So my next question is, if you win, as you think you will, um, do you think the other side's principles are going to change? And usually the first response is no, because they don't have any principles. Uh, but after that, they'll usually acknowledge, no, they probably won't. So then we can have the conversation that not that your principles aren't important and not that they don't allow you to put your head on the pillow at night and sleep, but we're in a process that doesn't prove principles. It gives you legal closure. It'll decide who owes or doesn't owe money because your principles are too important for you to hand them over to anybody else, including me. Um, and it, it, it gives them a little crack of freedom if they wish it, wish to have it to decide, okay, I can decide this case and not feel like I'm compromising the core of my character to decide this. Uh, and, um, and, and that's, and I'm, I'm, I guess I, I went there because the harder the disputes, uh, the more tragic the losses, the bigger the consequences are, um, the more principled people will feel about it. And, and we have to address it some way and not go around the barn to get there. I love that articulation, Sam, because not only is it extremely practical, but it also reflects everything that's going on in our society today. It is, you know, it's been said that politics today is, is the new religion. And when people, you said, when people have God on their side, there's no room for compromise. 
And so we've got a system that is breaking down before our eyes because I'm right and I know I'm right and God knows I'm right. And therefore, why should I compromise? I can't compromise because that's compromising my values and my principles rather than saying we have to live in a society together and we have to get along with each other and we have to make it work. And that means we have to find some way of bridging the distance and the willingness to entertain the possibility that someone else has a legitimate point of view, even if it's not mine, requires a measure of maturity that is becoming more and more rare. And then again, it goes, well, I like the, the title of your book so much, yeah. the Positively Conflicted. I, uh, if you're familiar with the works of Stephen Carter, um, you know, he, he, um, he talks about this term constructive disagreement that when we are willing to hear people out, what you refer to as radical listening, which is, a, I love that phrase, to hear the other side, not only do we understand the other person, but we end up understanding ourselves better. There, there's a story in, in Jewish tradition, um, one of the great, great rabbis, his name was Rabbi Yochanan, and he had a main disciple, and they argued about everything. And then his disciple died, and he was crestfallen. He went into a deep depression. And the sages said, we have to do something for Rabbi Yochanan. We have to help him. So they found another very distinguished scholar and put him in Rabbi Yochanan's class. And everything Rabbi Yochanan said, this other rabbi brought 24 proofs that he was right. Oh. And it didn't take long before he said, get out of here. <laughs> he said, I know I'm right. <laughs> I don't need you to tell me that. But my, my former disciple, he would pose 24 questions and challenges to everything I said. And by working through those objections, we came to a deeper understanding of the truth. Where is the integrity, the confidence to know I can be right and I'm not afraid of people who are going to challenge me? Because then we can, we can discover new insights and every once in a while, who knows? Maybe I am wrong. Wouldn't I rather discover I'm wrong than persist in being wrong? And, and I, I think among the challenges are, um, there's a guy named Caldini at, at uh, Arizona State who talks about influence. You, you both may have read him. But one of the things um, he talks about is, is commitment. One way to influence people is because we don't like to go back against our public commitments. And we've got so many things on social media. It's not just our community and it's just not just the three of you, the three of us that are saying things. Once I've said it, it becomes like you were talking about in your, in your argument earlier, Rabbi, well, you, you just, you double down um, because it, it's, it's embarrassing and it makes me vulnerable and, and that, that becomes too scary. So unless someone in a leadership capacity can do that, um, then it's, uh, it, it's difficult to see where we go. It, it, it'll happen at some point or we'll have a power to power kind of circumstance, whether it's personal or political or where, where one side or the other will break and then we'll see how everybody um, recovers from that. Uh, but, it, but it is so painful to watch, just so painful to watch. It is, we had a beautiful example of the radical listening and radical compassion uh, with Daryl Davis and the KKK mm -hmm. and how he ended up befriending some of the higher ups in the KKK and eventually because of the friendship and mutual listening and understanding, um, they were able to come to an agreement and even uh, the KKK would, many of them resigned from it. And I think that that was a brilliant example. So my thoughts go to you now, sir. Um, Mary, who is one of our frequent flyers and she is a, a loyal listener, Ask the question, I think it's very thoughtful. Do you have someone, sir, that helps you debrief, other than your beautiful wife, because I know she's there, <laughs> uh, after intense negotiations? Um, yeah, I, I've got more than one person. One, I've got, a, I've got a partner, who, and we've been partners for over 30 years, who actually started mediating before me, Joe O'Connor. Um, and certainly before the pandemic, less so once the pandemic started, we, we'd both be mediating and we'd go into each other's offices and say, what's, here's what's going on. I'm not responding very well to this. I don't think I'm being very helpful. Do you have any ideas? 
Um, and afterwards, in fact, it just happened earlier today when I was walking down the hall, he had a, a very complicated mediation he was doing on Friday. And I asked, how did it get done? And, and he said, uh, yes, it did. And we talked about how that happened. Um, right. And there, there seems to come in, in most disputes, at least that we're doing, where they, they kind of hit a tipping point. And you can say, OK, we didn't think there was a way through, but now there is. And what what mediators do is we help people have the conversation they they haven't been able to have on their own. It used to be, I would love to go home or tell my partners, you know, they say, did you settle the case? And I loved saying, yes, I settled the case. Well, what I've realized again, as I've gotten older, I don't settle any of these cases. Um, I do help people have conversations and rephrase things and talk to each other or carry messages in a way that they had not been found. They had not been able to find a way to do, but here's the, here are the statistics. 98% of all lawsuits settle, not, not 50, 98%. And if that's true, there are plenty of mediators out there that aren't me. It's not because I speak of the magic fairy dust you talked about earlier, doctor. It's not, it's not that I've got this magic fairy dust to sprinkle, um, but we can engage and we can be patient and we can have some perseverance and we can let people behave badly and not act like we're the school principal. Um, but that, again, I don't do well with short answers. I tell my students that, so they're, they're careful <laughs> about their questions. But I've got, I've got, not only do I have my wife, Patty, I've got my friend, Joe Connor, and I've got, I continue with, with my, uh, my recovery from, from, from alcoholism, I continue to talk to people. I don't share confidential details uh, of anything, but, but there are still people in my life that are continuing to, to practice not drinking and all that comes along with that. That's courageous that you share that. I'm, I'm sure you inspire many people to rethink uh, some of their uh, choices, whether it's drinking or the use of anger. And anger is an altered state of awareness. Absolutely, it's chemical. It absolutely it is, chemical. is chemical. And some people live in that state because they find it to be the most energizing and safe and they're ready to pounce at any moment. Hard to be married to someone like that or work with someone like that, but they seem to find a way to continue it. And I just always know they're scared. Well, I do. And there are times, I mean, when, when my editors were, were reading my book, they said, you need a chapter on standing up for yourself. You talk about all these things, but sometimes, which is why it's the last chapter in the book, um, but standing up for yourself can be saying, no, th th this is a conflict I'm not going to engage in. Th this is too dangerous for me. And radically listening is not even safe. So I think the, the first question in any conflict is one, is it worth it? And two, is it safe? Uh, and those are really important questions. And sometimes if you're wavering on whether it's safe or not, you need to ask somebody else. I I'm not always the best arbiter when I'm all stirred up about whether or not it's safe. And it's, it's, a, it's a huge question, particularly in the most difficult kinds of conflicts. Well, what are the warning signs that something's not safe or someone is not safe? Um, it, if, if I sense beyond just my discomfort with conflict that I really feel unsafe, that, I, that, I'm really, that I'm really wrestling with the fight or flight, or that I'm aware that my response to what they're saying, even in my own sense, is disproportionate to what they're saying, or more importantly, I realize their response to me is disproportionate. Or physical space, if people start narrowing physical space and you don't have a familiar relationship or, or a culture, I mean, some cultures do deal with conflict nose to nose, other cultures don't. So you want to be aware of your cultural con uh, your cult cultural context. Another is tone of voice. If, if, you see, if you're talking to somebody and you'll see they'll catch in their throat a little bit, meaning they're, they're probably nervous or scared, it's a time to pay attention. It, it may be that it's, it may not be safe for them. I mean, I don't mean that we can take care of everybody else all the time, but I want to pay attention to both sides of it. But physical space and disproportionate responses um, are really important. You, know, you, you said something on the way that really started with Mary's question, um, the importance of having people that we can talk to, uh, objective voices, because we're always going to be somewhat skewed in the way we see our own circumstance. We're always going to be looking for uh, a way to, to look at ourselves in the best angle. And so having those people in our lives that are trusted advisors is, is a critical element. You talk about um, someone who influenced you very early on and helped you change your whole worldview, a person named Red. Um, can you tell us a little bit about him? Yeah, he, he was a bigger than life personality. And, and when, when I first stopped drinking, somebody just kind of took me over to his house and dropped me off. Um, and he was, he, was a, he was big physically and he was big orally. He just, he was a big person. Um, and 
like six foot two, 250 pounds, big red beard, red hair, and a big baritone voice. Um, and, and I still remember when I was sitting there in, in his house and his wife was there with him and I've got a Kleenex and I'm just kind of sobbing. And at the point, I've got uh, a wife, I'm a trial lawyer, Patty and I have three young daughters um, and I'm at this guy's house sobbing and she's wondering why in the heck am I even still married to this guy? Um, and, and, he, and I remember him saying to me, kid, because he called me kid, he, he's about 30 years older than me. He said, if I asked you to put down on paper what you hope for a year from now, and you don't drink between now and then, you would so underestimate where you will be that I'm not even gonna ask you to write it down. Wow. Um, and it was the first moment that I felt a hint of hope. Um, and then as I begin the book with a story about going on a trip with him what I, that I was terrified to go on. Um, and, but but he, 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 would, he would say, you know, until you can deal with your own internal conflicts, you can't deal with anything else. Until you can align those and at least recognize where they don't align, there's simply nothing for you to do. Now, we don't have time in a mediation session to do that, but those things are happening all the time, at, at least dynamically. And you know, Red was, um, and, and the other thing he was helpful to me for, he was, he was one of the most insightful people I'd ever met. He also could be one of the angriest people I'd ever met. Um, and it was a reminder to me that, that we're not binary. We, all, we, we get it all. Um, there, it's not it's not that I'm all good or I'm all bad. I'm, I mean, some days I might be better or worse than others. I've got a, a friend, I mentioned him in the, in the book too. He was having a horrible time. And he said, I said, how are you doing, Phil? And he said, you know, Sam, I may not be much, but I'm all I think about. Um, and I thought that so described the human condition for me. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking about myself so much that if I can come to some kind of peace with who I am, flawed as that may be, um, then it gives me a chance to reach out and actually have honest relationships with other people, which is um, what I find the most satisfying. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. And I think that we're seeing why you're so successful as a negotiator and earlier as a litigator, because I do not believe any conflict can be um, mediated or resolved in any way if we don't know ourselves or have the courage enough to love ourselves just the way we are and know how we impact others when we're, do, we're doing something yummy or something not so yummy, I think that, that that courage to know ourselves is the secret to that mediation. So I can see why you're so successful. I promise you it comes and it goes. <laughs> I hope so. Is anything that static isn't real. <laughs> that's right, that's right. May you we're always all have fun. Huh? We're all Sorry, Rabbi. progress. Uh, yeah, and life is a messy teacher. It, it certainly is. And as I was telling you, doctor, before we started, um, a, a friend of mine has, has said for years, um, we're all special and we all suffer. Um, and, and keeping those in balance and proportion is, is pretty important. And I, I, have, I, I have, I tend to naturally have greater compassion for somebody that suffers in the same way I do. Um, if your suffering or your struggle is different from mine, then I have a, a tendency to discount it or think you just ought to get over it or offer unsolicited advice that nobody's asking for. Uh, and it, it, it's um, I, I, just remembering that I, I found to be enormously helpful. I'm not the only one that's suffering. I like that idea of the compassion and knowing that our understanding is going to be limited if it doesn't come from a personal sense of understanding. I think that that's um, good to remind ourselves how limited we can be. Well, and even understanding when I when I'm talking with people about mediating or negotiating, among the things I suggest that they not say, I don't say many nevers, but I do say this. I don't tell people what they need to understand, what they have to understand or what they should understand, um, because I can't control how somebody else understands or whether they have the capacity to. And I even want to the way I think about it is understanding in some ways is a gift and acceptance is a choice. Um, I, I may think I understand what you're going through, but if you've gone through a horrific circumstance and I haven't lived it and I tell you I understand, then at some level I've belittled what you've been through. Um, and if I say I understand just as a placekeeper to move the conversation along, I've also belittled that. Uh, so understanding, I think, is great when we have it. I think sometimes we think we have it and we don't, um, just as when somebody may tell us they understand and we don't think they do. So uh, I, I like the distinction between understanding and acceptance. It's an important distinction, really. Wow. Wow. Give us a lot to think about, sir. 
Is well, really- I, I, I love this stuff because it, it, it was truly was life saving for me. Um, and I get to talk to other people about it. And on my good days, it's not about me. On my bad days, it is about me. And um, I, I've met so many really wonderful people that do their job so well and care for their clients well. And, um, and at the same time, there have been you know, tragedies along the way with, with, uh, with family law cases and other things that are, that are just deeply tragic with people suffering in ways that maybe we don't understand and responding in ways that we can't understand. So um, I'm, I'm glad there's some stuff to think about. Now we can decide whether or not we want to practice it. Well, that yes. certainly is the, uh, that's the hard step. Uh, you know, theory is wonderful. Ideas are inspiring. Putting them into practice is where the rubber hits the road. Um, but, you know, you said something just now that, that made me think, you know, in the speaking business, um, what makes a speaker distinct or differentiated is the word we use. Uh, if I can talk about my own experience, because that's something nobody else can talk about. But then if I could talk about my own experience in a way that makes it about the audience, makes it about the listener. And that's a real gift. And, and I think you, you've gone a long way to doing that, is taking your experience, universalizing it, sharing your experience and not making it about you. If, if more of us could do more of that, um, I think there'd be a lot less need for what you do so well that's very kind. i don't want to put you out of work but <laughs> <laughs> that'd be fine i'm old enough that'd be okay oh i'm i'm sorry to say i don't think you'll ever be out of work um i wish you would be um just as uh, it would be nice if the rabbi and i would be as well for what we do it's interesting well rabbi Bye-bye. i think it might be time for the word of the day what you got for us sir i think you might be right Every now and then I'm right, I'm bound to be. <laughs> this word came to me because I, I used it this morning in a, uh, in a blog post that I wrote. Uh, we're recording this on the 10th day of the Hebrew month of Tevis, which is a Jewish day of mourning. I'm actually fasting today. Uh, we have several fast days scattered through the year that are connected to the destruction, destruction of the temple in Jerusalem uh, about 24 centuries ago by the Babylonians and 500 years after that by the Romans. And today commemorates the beginning of the Babylonian siege that eventually resulted in the destruction of Jerusalem. And it's, it's also worth noting that we're a couple of days after the devastating tornadoes that swept through so much of the country. And, uh, and a friend of mine just mentioned this this morning, really got me thinking that it's you know, when you think about events that happened 2,000 years ago, it's easy to, to disassociate. But when we think about the serious um, struggles that people go through on a day-to-day basis, um, connecting the past with the present is, is a powerful uh, device for us to use, to contextualize and to empathize. And so the word of the day is malevolent, which means wishing evil or harm to another or others, showing ill will, being ill disposed or malicious. And I think it's a a particularly relevant word because the tornado sweeping through uh, parts of the country, it it wasn't malevolent, it didn't have ill will. It, it It was nature. And even for those of us who have a, have a theological approach, uh, providence is something that we really can't fathom. We can't understand the designs. We can't understand the ultimate justice. It's beyond our capacity. But there are times when ill fortune comes upon us and we just have to deal with the aftermath. When we think about the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, that was, that was absolutely malevolent. It was pure evil. It was pure um, vindictiveness against a philosophy and a way of life and an outlook that was antithetical to the the selfish self-interest of the society. And so when we come in conflict with other people, we often attribute to them malevolent intentions. And what you're enabling us to see better, Sam, is that most people are entirely justified in their own minds. And in some cases, they may be truly justified. But if we 
enter into conflict willing to give people the benefit of the doubt, willing to presume positive intent, willing to make the effort to listen to their side and try to understand where they're coming from. If we can eliminate that elements of perceived malevolence, that goes a long way to helping us resolve these conflicts in a way where we can, we can at least be at peace with the, with the results, with the outcomes, and create a more harmonious world for ourselves and for others. Wow. <laughs> See, he was inspired by you, Sam. <laughs> and I by him. He is very inspiring. So Sam, yeah. do you have a, a final thought you'd like to leave us with? Uh, well, I, I guess going back to what I said said about, you know, when, when you feel this physical, the conflict is a full body experience. I mean, most of us kind of want to go down the hall and shut the door uh, with it is to be aware of that. Um, and when you notice it, when I talk about, um, you know, pausing and assessing and responding par, when, when you feel it, there's a great quote in an Immortals book called Rules of Civility um, that I think just nails it. I wish I'd written it, but I didn't. Um, it, but it's, it's a good reminder for all of us. In response to that, why don't you change so I'll feel better, which is kind of a natural response to conflict. Here's what Immortals, one of Immortals character says, is if in times of high emotion, the next thing you're about to say makes you feel better, it's probably the wrong thing to say. Um, and and I've, whether it's my example in the mediation with the young woman years ago, or with my wife, or with my partners, or with people in politics, um, as you see all this energy and advocacy and showmanship and performance, if instead they think a little bit more about that and be aware of the physicality of it and be aware that they need to decide whether they'd rather be right or rather be married, um, rather be right or help govern the country, then the, it opens perhaps a crack of light for them to have some conversations, even if privately and not in front of the cameras. Very nice. Wow. And, and you, just, you just made me think of a different word of the day I could have used, which is uh, the Pyrrhic victory. Um, <laughs> Pyrrhic victory is when you, you win the battle and, and lose the war. And uh, that can happen quite a bit when uh, you know, we fight and we can actually win the argument and destroy a relationship. Uh, destroy an enterprise, destroy a culture. So, uh, so thank you for uh, for helping us see the bigger picture, helping uh, us have some techniques we can use to actually put these ideas and these principles into practice. And uh, and we wish you continued success in uh, in spreading the word that is so vitally important today. So thank you for being with us. And, Absolutely. Uh, well, I've ordered your book in uh, Amazon, um, and uh, I'm going to be reading it on my iPhone this holiday. And if you look here in the chat, I put the, the Amazon link to it. It's samartery.com, A-R-D-E-R-Y. The book is Positively Conflicted, and I think that it's a must read for anyone who wants to have good relationships and be successful in what they do at work and at home. I think it really is a must read. Well, it was a pleasure being here. I can't thank you enough for having me. Thank well, you. We're just delighted. So I have a, a final thing to say. As a psychologist, I see that what you're doing is so brilliant um, with, with negotiations and mediations. Now, I want to remind people of two things. One is that anger is a gift. It gives us passion. It helps us take notice you can't live in the anger for very long. So either other people are noticing us or we are. It gives us energy to move off of a status quo. It doesn't mean we should yell and scream or harm people, but it certainly is a gift of energy. And I think if we look at it that way, I think that's gonna help the world to get to the place of listening more thoughtfully and understanding how do we each contribute to this situation and what am I missing that I don't understand this. And the other thing is, related to something you had said, sir, um, that I tell most of my clients and most of my audiences, repeat after me, I'm wonderful. And then they say, I'm wonderful. I'm awful. I'm awful. And they look at me like I'm crazy. And then I lean in and say, now get over it. <laughs> and I think that's what you demonstrated. 
that we all have some of the positive energy and some of the, the yuckiness that we bring to any situation to add clarity and uh, chaos. So we both, we have both. And the point is to not be so self-righteous. I think that when we double down or get on our high horses, it's hard to want to look like we've lost, but any conflict can be a form of winning or losing, it's up to us. And uh, I think the, the winner is the one who not only makes the best agreements that move forward uh, relationships and businesses and governments, uh, but the person who seeks to understand even if they can never truly understand. So that's all I had to say. Rabbi, you have a final thought, sir? I'm good. I think you said it all, doctor. <laughs> all right, thank you. Well, everyone, thank you for joining the Rabbi and the Shrink. You can reach us at podcast at the rabbi and the shrink.com. And we're looking forward to seeing you next time. If you have questions, remember samartery.com. He's got answers for you. Thank you all and be welcome.